Part 1. The Dead Travel Fast. Jonathan Harker's diary, written in Bistritz. The 3rd of May. I left Munich for Transylvania on the 1st of May. When I arrived there at the Golden Krona Hotel, the landlady, a very friendly old woman, welcomed me at the door of the hotel and said, The Herr Englishman? Yes, I replied, and she gave me this letter. My friend, welcome to the Carpathians. Sleep well tonight. At three tomorrow, a coach will start for Bukovina. A place on it is kept for you. At the Borgo Pass, my coach will wait for you and bring you to me. Your friend, Dracula. The 4th of May. Just before I was about to take the coach, the landlady came up to my room. Must you go? Oh, young hare, must you go? Then she asked me, Do you know what day it is? I told her that it was the 4th of May. No, no, more than that, she said. It is the eve of St. George's Day. Don't you know that tonight at midnight all the evil things in the world will have complete power? She then fell down on her knees and implored me not to go. But I had to go. The landlady then stood up and, taking a crucifix from her neck, offered it to me. I did not know what to do, because, as a member of the Church of England, I had been taught to see such things as somewhat idolatrous, but I did not want to offend the old lady. She saw the doubt on my face and put the crucifix around my neck and said, Take it for your mother's sake. I do not know why, but I am feeling worried. If this diary reaches Mina before I do, then it will be my goodbye. Here comes the coach. The 5th of May. The castle. When I got on the coach, the driver was talking with the landlady. Some people came and listened and then looked at me with pity. A number of words were repeated often. I looked them up in my polyglot dictionary. They were Ordog, Satan, Pokol, Hell, Stregoitza, Witch, Vrolok, and Vlokzak, both of which mean the same thing, one being Slovak, and the other Serbian for something which is either werewolf or vampire. Mem, I must ask the Count about these superstitions. I soon forgot about my fears as we travelled through this green, hilly land of forests and farmhouses. The driver clearly wanted to arrive quickly at the Borgo Pass. After some time, we could see the Carpathian Mountains above these hills. As it grew dark, the other passengers kept telling the driver to go faster. Through the darkness, I could see an area of grey light ahead of us. Then the mountains seemed to come nearer to us on each side. We were entering the Borgo Pass. The coach stopped and we waited for the Count's coach to arrive. The driver said softly to another passenger that we were an hour early. Then the driver said to me, You see, no one is here for you. You can go on to Bukovina and then return another day. Just then the horses became very excited. The passengers screamed and crossed themselves. A coach with four beautiful black horses arrived. Its driver was a tall man with a long brown beard and a great black hat that hid his face. His eyes seemed red in the lamplight. 
he said to our driver, You are early tonight, my friend. The uh, English uh, was in a hurry. Our driver stammered. That is why you told him to go on to Bukovina. You cannot deceive me, my friend. I know too much, and my horses are too fast. As this strange man spoke, I could see his very red lips and his sharp teeth as white as ivory. One of my companions in the coach whispered a line from a German poem. Denn die Toten reiten schnell, for the dead travel fast. The strange driver smiled at this and said, Give me the hare's luggage. Then he quickly put my bags into his coach and helped me in with a hand that held me in a grip of steel. Without a word, we started off into the darkness of the Borgo Pass. The coach went extremely fast, and it seemed to me that we were simply going around in a big circle, so I took note of some distinctive point. I then discovered that we were, in fact, going around in a circle. I looked at my watch and discovered that it was almost midnight. Suddenly, on our left, I saw a faint blue flame. The driver stopped the horses and, jumping to the ground, disappeared into the darkness. Soon he reappeared. I think I must have fallen asleep and kept dreaming of this incident because it seemed to be repeated endlessly. Now it seems like an awful nightmare. Once the flame appeared near the road, and I could observe the driver making a strange construction of stones around it. Another time I saw him standing between me and the flame, but he did not seem to obstruct it. Then another time the driver stopped the coach and went even farther away. The horses began to tremble. I could not understand why, since the wolves had stopped howling. But just then, the moon came out from behind some black clouds, and I saw around us a circle of wolves. All at once, with the appearance of the moon, they began to howl. I shouted for the driver and tried to scare the wolves away. He appeared and shouted some command and waved his arms. The wolves moved away. This was so strange that I was too afraid to move or speak. Then we travelled for an endlessly long time. Suddenly I saw that we had arrived in the courtyard of a vast, ruined castle. I must have fallen asleep, because I did not notice our arrival at the Count's castle. When the coach stopped, the driver jumped down and helped me out, and then jumped back on the coach and drove away. What was going to happen? What kind of people lived here? Was this the usual kind of thing that happened to a solicitor who was sent out to explain the purchase of a London estate to a foreigner? Just then I heard the massive door opening. Inside stood a tall old man with a long white moustache and all dressed in black. The old man signalled with his right hand for me to enter and said in excellent English with a strange intonation, Welcome to my house. Enter freely and of your own will. He did not come closer to greet me but stood like a statue. But the moment I entered, he moved forward and shook my hand so hard that it hurt. His hand felt more like the hand of a dead man than that of a living man. Welcome to my house, he continued. Come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring. The strength of his handshake reminded me of the driver, so I said... Count Dracula? I am Dracula, he replied. Welcome, 
Mr. Harker. Come in. You must eat and rest. He himself carried my bags up the stairs to a small room without windows and then into a great bedroom well lighted and warmed with a log fire. I washed and changed quickly because I was very hungry. When I went to the other room, the Count said, Please be seated and dine as you please. Please excuse me if I do not join you, but I have already dined. After dinner, I smoked a cigar and observed his face. His nose had a high bridge and peculiar nostrils. His eyebrows were massive and almost met over the nose. The mouth under the heavy white moustache was rather cruel-looking, with peculiarly sharp teeth, which protruded over the lips. His lips seemed incredibly red for a man his age. His ears were pale, and at the tops extremely pointed. The chin was broad and strong. His hands were broad, with short fingers. Strange to say, there were hairs in the centre of the palms. The nails were long and fine, and cut to a sharp point. In addition, his breath stank, which gave me a feeling of nausea. The 7th of May After breakfast I found a sort of library. It was filled with books about England. While I was reading, the Count came in and greeted me. I am glad you found my library. Unfortunately, I only know your language through books. I hope you can teach me how to speak it. But, Count, I said, you know and speak English very well. Thank you, he replied. But I only know the words and grammar. I don't know how to speak them. Everybody in London would know that I am a stranger. Here I am noble, but a stranger in a strange land is no one. I told him that I would be happy to teach him, and then I asked if I could come into the library when I wanted. Yes, certainly, he answered. You may go anywhere you wish in the castle, except where the doors are locked, where, of course, you will not wish to go. We are in Transylvania, and Transylvania is not England. This led to much conversation. I asked him about the blue flames. He said that it was believed that on certain nights of the year, when all the evil spirits have complete power, the night before, in fact, there appear those blue flames over places where treasure has been buried. This region, he explained, had been invaded many times, and each time the residents would bury their treasures so they would not be found by the invaders. The Count and I looked at all the papers regarding the house, and he signed the necessary documents. He then asked me how I had found such a good place. I showed him some Kodaks and read to him the notes I had taken. This very old estate is called Carfax, and its house is large. One large house nearby has recently become a lunatic asylum. The 8th of May I began to fear that I wrote too much in this diary, but now I'm glad that I did. I need these facts so that my imagination does not get out of control. This morning, I got up and hung my shaving mirror by the window. I began to shave, when suddenly I felt a hand on my shoulder and heard the Count's voice saying to me, Good morning. I started because I was surprised that I had not seen his reflection in my mirror. In starting, I had cut myself slightly. I said good morning to the Count and looked at the mirror again to see if I had been mistaken. 
now the Count was near me, and I still could not see him in the mirror. At that moment, I could see that the cut was bleeding a little. When the Count saw my face, his face blazed with a sort of demoniac fury, and he tried to grab my throat. I pulled away, and his hand touched the crucifix around my neck. It made an instant change in him. The fury went away so quickly that it was difficult to believe that it had ever been there. Take care, he said. Take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. Then he grabbed my shaving mirror and said, And this is the horrible thing, this toy of man's vanity that has caused this trouble. He pulled open the window and threw it out. Afterwards, I went down to have breakfast, but the Count was nowhere around. It is strange that I haven't seen him eat or drink yet. Then I went to look around the castle. I looked south from the window. The castle is on a precipice a thousand feet high. Doors, doors, doors everywhere, and all locked. The only exit from the castle is from the windows. The castle is a veritable prison, and I am a prisoner. Part 3. The Count Arrives in England Letter from Miss Mina Murray to Miss Lucy Westenra 9th of May My dearest Lucy, forgive me if I haven't written to you for such a long time, but I have had a lot of work. I can't wait to be with you by the sea. Jonathan has written me a few lines from Transylvania. He is well and will return in about a week. Tell me all the news when you write. You have not told me anything for a long time. I hear rumours about a tall, handsome, curly-haired man. Love, Mina. Letter from Lucy Westenra to Mina Murray. 17 Chatham Street, Wednesday. My dearest Mina, don't say I haven't written to you. I have already written to you twice since we parted. Mr. Arthur Homewood is the curly-haired man that you have heard about. He often comes to see Mamma and me. Some time ago, Arthur introduced me to a man who would be perfect for you if you were not already engaged to Jonathan. His name is Dr. Seward, and he is only 29. He directs an immense lunatic asylum. He is very calm and very strong. Mina, we have told all our secrets to each other since we were children. I love Arthur. Write to me soon, Lucy. Letter from Lucy Westenra to Mina Murray. The 24th of May. My dearest Mina, thanks and thanks and thanks again for your sweet letter. It was so nice to be able to tell you about Arthur and have your sympathy. Mina, you will not believe it. I have never had a serious proposal of marriage until today, and today I have had three. You must not tell anyone except Jonathan. The first one I have already told you about. His name is Dr. John Seward, the lunatic asylum man. He was very cool on the outside, but very nervous. Unfortunately, I had to say no. He asked me if there was someone else, because he wanted to know if he had a chance. I told him there was. I felt so sad for him. Evening. Arthur has just gone, so I'm feeling better, and I can tell you about number two. He is such a nice fellow. His name is Quincy P. Morris. He is a happy and jolly man, who has had fabulous adventures all around the world. 
Sometimes he even speaks American slang with me. Oh, Mina, you must think me such a horrid flirt. He also asked me to marry him, and I had to tell him no. Oh, about number three, Arthur. It was all so confused. It seemed only a moment after he entered the room that he had his arms around me and was kissing me. I am very happy. Ever your loving Lucy. Mina Murray's Diary. The 24th of July, Whitby. Lucy met me at the station. This is a lovely place. Between the abbey and the town is a church with a big graveyard full of tombstones. This is the nicest spot. There is a wonderful view of the town and the harbour. I will come here often. In fact, I am writing here now. Dr. Seward's Diary. 5th of June. To forget Lucy, I am studying a strange man called Renfield. His case grows more interesting the more I understand him. He is very secretive and selfish, and he seems to have some secret plan. The good thing about Renfield is his great love for animals. But his pets are often odd. Now he is catching flies. He has a large quantity of them now. I tried to persuade him to get rid of them. May, may I have three days? I, I will get rid of them then. I told him yes. 18th of June. Now he has spiders, and he keeps feeding them with his flies. 1st of July. His spiders are very numerous and are becoming a problem now. I told him that he must get rid of them too. He looked sad but said yes. While I was talking to him, he disgusted me greatly. An enormous fly was buzzing around the room. He caught it and held it happily for a moment. Then he put it in his mouth and ate it. 19th of July. We are progressing. Renfield now has many sparrows and his flies and spiders are almost eliminated. When I came in, he said he wanted to ask me a big favour. I asked him what he wanted. He said, a, a kitten. A nice little playful kitten that I can play with and teach and feed and feed and feed. I was not surprised by this request, but I told him no. 20th of July. I visited Renfield early in the morning. He was very happy and was placing sugar out to catch more flies. His sparrows were not there. He said that they had escaped. There were a few feathers around the room, and on his pillow there was a drop of blood. 11 a.m. The attendant has just been to me to say that Renfield has been very sick. He vomited a lot of feathers. I think, Doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds and that he just took and ate them raw. Cutting from the Daily Graph, 8th of August. Pasted in Mina Murray's journal. From a correspondent. Whitby. Here in Whitby we have just had one of the greatest storms on record. The results of this storm were strange and unique. Before the storm, the weather had been very sultry, which is not unusual for August. There were a lot of holidaymakers around. Then in the afternoon, the Coast Guard said that a storm was coming. The sunset was very beautiful. A little before ten o'clock in the evening, the air grew very still and oppressive. Then, without warning, the storm came with a rapidity that seemed incredible. All of nature was changed. 
The sea, which had been calm a moment before, was full of gigantic waves like roaring monsters. In addition, a thick sea fog came. A searchlight was used to help the boats come to shore in the fog. After a few minutes, this searchlight discovered a ship that was coming into the port. Everybody was afraid that this ship would hit the reef that was between the ship and the port. But just then, an even thicker sea fog came that covered everything. You could not see anything at all. Suddenly, the wind changed direction and blew away the fog. We could see the ship speeding into the harbour. The searchlight continued to follow the ship, and suddenly everyone saw something horrible. There was a dead man tied to the helm of the ship, and his head went back and forth with the movement of the ship. This ship had arrived safely in port, guided by the hand of a dead man. The Coast Guard discovered that the name of the ship is the Demeter. They also found the captain's log that told of the ship's voyage from Varna on the coast of Romania to Whitby. The log told about strange things that happened on the ship and the presence of a strange man. One by one the crew died until only the captain was left. He tied himself to the wheel and held a crucifix in his hand. That is how we found him except he was dead. Mina Murray's Diary The 11th of August, 3 a.m. Lucy sleepwalked when she was younger, and then she stopped. But now she has started again. Earlier this evening, I fell asleep as soon as I had closed my diary. Suddenly I woke up and felt very afraid. I looked around and saw that Lucy's bed was empty. I looked around the house and could not find her. I found the front door open, so I went outside. I ran all the way to the west cliff and looked across the harbour to the east cliff, where Lucy and I liked to sit. It was far away, but I could see well in the moonlight, and on our favourite seat I saw someone dressed in white lying on the bench. I thought I saw something dark over the figure in white. I could not see whether it was a man or a beast, because a cloud blocked the moon. I ran down the stairs of the west cliff, through the town, and up the stairs of the east cliff to our favourite seat. When I was close, I could see something long and black bending over the white figure. I called in fright, Lucy! Lucy! And something lifted its head, and I could see a white face and red, shining eyes. I ran to the seat and found Lucy lying there, completely alone. She was still sleeping and breathing with difficulty. I put a shawl on her and closed it at her throat with a big safety pin. I think I pricked her throat by accident with the safety pin, because she put her hand on her throat and moaned. Oh... I then accompanied her home. 15th of August. Lucy's mother has told me that she is dying. The doctor said that her heart is very weak. She must not be excited for any reason or she will die. I must not tell her that Lucy has been sleepwalking again. Letter about the delivery of 50 boxes of earth to Carfax Mansion from Samuel F. Billington and Son, solicitors, to Carter, Patterson and Company, London. 17th August. Dear Sirs, please deliver these 50 boxes to Carfax. You should place them in the old chapel of the mansion. We have enclosed the keys because the owner of the mansion has not arrived yet. Please deliver these boxes quickly. Faithfully yours, Samuel F. Billington and Son. Mina Murray's Diary the 19th of August. Joy, 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 although not all joy. At last, news from Jonathan. He has been ill. That is why he hasn't written. He is in a hospital in Budapest. I am going there immediately to help him. Mr Hawkins thinks it would be a good idea if we married there. Dr Seward's Diary 
Nineteenth of August. Strange and sudden change in Renfield last night. Normally, he is very nice and respectful with the attendant, but last night, Renfield said to him, "I don't want to talk to you. You are not important now. The master is near. He is coming." Letter from Mina Harker to Lucy Westenra. Budapest, the twenty-fourth of August. My dearest Lucy, I know you are anxious to hear all that has happened since we parted. I found Jonathan greatly changed. I am now writing at his bedside. He is waking. When he woke, he asked me for his coat. In the pocket, there was a notebook. He saw that I was interested in it. He told me that it contained all the secrets of what happened, but he said that now he does not want to know. He said, "I want to begin my life here, with our marriage." So we both agreed never to look at the notebook unless it was absolutely necessary. Yes, my dear Lucy, we are going to be married. After this talk, Jonathan fell asleep again. I asked the nurse if we could be married this afternoon, and I am now waiting for her reply. Jonathan woke up, and we were married. I am so happy. I hope you will be as happy as we are now. Love, Mina. Letter from Arthur Holmwood to Doctor Seward. My dear Jack, I want you to do me a favour. Lucy is ill. She has no special disease, but she looks terrible. I need your help. You must come and see her. I know it will be difficult for you, but you must do it for her. I want to talk to you alone after you have seen her. You must come, Arthur. Letter from Doctor Seward to Arthur Homewood. Second of September. My dear old fellow. I examined Lucy, and since I am not able to understand her problem, I have written to my old friend and master, Professor Van Helsing of Amsterdam. He knows about every strange disease in the world. He is a philosopher, and one of the most advanced scientists in the world. He also has an open mind, a lot of courage, and the kindest heart in the world. Yours always, John Seward. Letter from Doctor Seward to Arthur Homewood. Third of September. My dear Art, Van Helsing has come and gone. He came with me to see Lucy when her poor dying mother was out. He examined her carefully. Later, when we were alone, he told me that Lucy's situation. Is very serious. It is a question of life or death. I asked him what he meant, but he said that he must think first. Don't be angry with me, Art. He will speak clearly when he has understood Lucy's situation. Now Van Helsing must go back to Amsterdam, but he will return. Your friend, Jack. Telegrams from Doctor Seward to Professor Van Helsing, Amsterdam. Fourth of September. Lucy is doing better today. Fifth of September. Lucy is still doing better. She has a good appetite and eats normally. Her colour is coming back. Sixth of September. Terrible change for the worse. Come at once. Doctor Seward's diary. Seventh of September. The first thing that Van Helsing said to me when we met was, "Have you said anything to Arthur yet?" No, I said. I wanted to wait until I saw you. Good, he replied. He should not know now. Perhaps. He will never know, but if it is necessary, he will know all. 
We went to Lucy's house. When we saw her, we were both shocked. She was terribly pale, and the bones of her face were prominent. Van Helsing and I left the room. My God, he said, this is dreadful. We have no time to lose. She will die because she doesn't have enough blood. We must give her a transfusion. We went downstairs to prepare the transfusion. Just then, someone knocked at the front door. It was Arthur. Jack, he said. I was so worried that I came immediately. Sir, said Van Helsing. Lucy needs blood immediately or she will die, he answered. We are going to perform a blood transfusion to put the blood from your full veins into her empty veins. When we arrived in Lucy's room, Van Helsing gave Lucy a narcotic to make her sleep. When Van Helsing was certain she was sleeping, he called Arthur into the room. You can give her one little kiss now while we prepare the instruments, said Van Helsing. Van Helsing performed the transfusion quickly and accurately. As the blood left Arthur and entered Lucy's veins, some life entered her face. Arthur, however, became paler and weaker. When the transfusion was finished, Van Helsing said, I think this brave lover deserves another kiss. He began to move Lucy's head on the pillow. As he did so, a narrow black band that Lucy always wore around her neck moved. It showed a red mark on her throat. Arthur did not notice it, but I could see that Professor Van Helsing did. Now, said the professor, take Arthur down and give him some port wine and let him lie down to rest. When I returned, Van Helsing and I looked at the red mark again. We saw that there were two small punctures over the external jugular vein. I thought that these two punctures were the cause of Lucy's loss of blood. But that was impossible. If blood had come out of those two punctures, Lucy's bed would be full of blood. I must go back to Amsterdam tonight, Van Helsing said. There are some books and things I will need. You must remain here tonight with Lucy. You must watch her every second. 8th of September. I was awake all night watching Lucy. This morning she woke up much better. This evening I went to Lucy's room again to keep her company during the night. She was happy that I was there. Whenever she seemed to be falling asleep, she forced herself to wake up again. She did this two or three times. Don't you want to sleep? I asked. No, I'm afraid, she replied. Afraid to go to sleep? Why? Everybody likes sleeping, I said. Not if you are like me. Sleep for me is the beginning of horror, she said. The beginning of horror? What does that mean? I asked. I don't know. I don't know, she said. And that is what makes it so horrible. A weakness comes to me when I am asleep. But my dear girl, I said, you can sleep tonight. I am here watching you, and I promise you that nothing will happen. Ah, uh, I can trust you, she said. I promise you that if I see that you are having a bad dream, I will wake you at once, I said. You will? Or will you really wake me? You are very good to me. Then I will sleep. And as soon as she had finished the sentence, she fell asleep. 9th of September. You are not going to stay awake tonight, Lucy said to me. There is a nice room next to mine where you can sleep. If there is any problem, I will call you immediately. Tonight you must sleep. I was so tired that I accepted her offer and slept in the other room. 10th of September. The professor put his hand on my head and I woke up immediately. And how is our patient? he said. 
She was well when I left her, or rather when she left me, I answered. Come, let us go and see, he said, and we went to her room. The blind was down and the room was dark. I raised the blind and the room filled with light. My God, said the professor. His face became pale and he pointed at the bed. There on the bed was poor Lucy. She appeared to have lost consciousness. Quick, he said. We must give her another transfusion, and this time Arthur is not here, so you must give her your blood. 11th of September. This afternoon I went to Lucy's house and found the professor very happy and Lucy much better. A moment after my arrival, a big parcel from abroad arrived for the professor. He opened it and pulled out some white flowers. These are for you, Lucy, he said. For me? Oh, Dr. Van Helsing. While he was speaking, Lucy was looking at the flowers and smelling them. Then she threw them down and said, Oh, Professor, I think you are joking with me. These flowers are only common garlic. To my surprise, the Professor became angry and said, I never joke. Everything I do is serious. Do not try to block my work. Then he saw that he had frightened Lucy, and he said quietly, Oh, Lucy, do not be afraid of me. I am doing this for your good. After we had finished, I said, Well, Professor, I know you always have a reason, but I don't understand what you are doing. A sceptic would say that you are using magic to keep out an evil spirit. Perhaps I am he answered quietly as he began to make the garlic necklace. 13th of September Van Helsing and I went to see Lucy. We arrived at eight o'clock. It was a beautiful morning. When we entered the house, Lucy's mother said to us, You will be happy to know that Lucy is better. She is still asleep now. Van Helsing smiled and said, My medicine is working. Don't take all the credit, Professor, said Mrs. Westenra. I helped Lucy too. What do you mean? asked the Professor. Well, she replied, last night she was sleeping well, but there was the terrible smell of those flowers. So I took them out and opened the window. Mrs. Westenra then left the room. For the first time, I saw Van Helsing lose control of himself. God, God, God! He said. What have we done to deserve this? We went and prepared ourselves for another transfusion. This time, Van Helsing himself gave blood. Article from the newspaper, The Pall Mall Gazette, 18th of September. The Pall Mall Gazette. The Escaped Wolf. I went to the zoological gardens to interview the keeper about the escaped wolf. He told me that the name of the escaped wolf was Berserker. On the day the wolf escaped, he said, there was a strange man in front of the wolf cage. He was a tall, thin man. He had red eyes. He said, These wolves are upset about something. Maybe it's you, I replied. No, they wouldn't hurt me, he said, and smiled, showing his sharp white teeth. That night at around midnight I went to the cage and found the bars broken and the wolf gone. That's all I know. Lucy Westenra's Diary The 17th of September Night. I went to bed with the flowers and soon fell asleep. Some flapping at the window awoke me. I was not afraid, but I wished Dr. Seward was in the next room. Dr. Van Helsing said that he had sent him a telegram telling him to come, but Dr. Seward had not arrived. Outside I heard a strange howling. 
I went to the window and looked, but I could only see a big bat which had been flapping against the window. I went back to bed, and then my mother came in. She said, I was worried about you, and got into bed with me. The flapping against the window continued, and my mother was very afraid. Then the howling began again, and there was a crash. The head of a giant wolf had broken through the window. My mother screamed in fright. Ah! For a second or two, she pointed at the wolf and made strange, horrible sounds. <laughs> then she fell over dead on top of me. I continued looking at the window, but the wolf went away, and lots of little specks were blown in. I don't remember what happened immediately after that. The air seems full of specks turning around in circles. The lights are blue and dim. My dear mother is gone, and now I must go too. Goodbye, dear Arthur. God protect you, and... God help me. Part Four The Bluefur Lady Dr. Seward's Diary 18th of September Dr. Van Helsing and I arrived at Lucy's house. On the 16th of September, Van Helsing had sent me a telegram in which he told me to spend the night protecting Lucy. I had only received the telegram this morning, so we were both worried since Lucy had spent the night alone. Nobody answered the door when we knocked. We opened the door and ran up to Lucy's room. We found her mother dead, and Lucy looked dead too. But Van Helsing examined her and discovered that her heart was still beating. We prepared ourselves for another blood transfusion. 20th of September. I spent the whole night next to Lucy's bed. At six o'clock in the morning, Van Helsing came in. When he saw Lucy's face, he said, Pull up the blinds. I need light. Then he started to examine her carefully. When he looked at her neck, he shouted, my God! My God! I came over to look too. The punctures on her throat had completely disappeared. She is dying, he said. She will soon be dead. Go and bring Arthur here. When Arthur and I came back to the room, Lucy said, Arthur, oh, my love, I am so happy you have come. Arthur was going to kiss Lucy when Van Helsing said, No, not yet. Hold her hand. It will comfort her more. Arthur sat down next to her and held her hand. She fell asleep. Then she began to change. She breathed with difficulty and her mouth opened and again her teeth seemed longer and sharper. Then her eyes opened, but she was still asleep. Arthur, she said in a strange, voluptuous voice. I am so glad you have come. Kiss me. Just as Arthur was going to kiss Lucy, Van Helsing grabbed him and pushed him away. Arthur was so surprised that he did not move. I kept looking at Lucy and saw anger in her face, and her sharp teeth closed with force. A moment later, Lucy woke up again and took Van Helsing's hand in hers and kissed it. Thank you, my friend, she said. Protect Arthur and give me peace. I promise, replied Van Helsing. Then he said to Arthur, Come, my child, take her hand in yours and kiss her on the forehead, and only once. Then Lucy's eyes closed, and her breathing became difficult. It is all over, said Van Helsing. 
she is dead. I took Arthur out of Lucy's room and downstairs. When I returned, I said to Van Helsing, Well, now the poor girl will have peace. Not, replied Van Helsing. This is only the beginning. What do you mean? I asked. But his only answer was, We can do nothing now. We must wait and see. An article from the newspaper, the Westminster Gazette, 25th of September. The Westminster Gazette. A Hampstead Mystery. Numerous children have returned home late in the evening or have not been found until the next day. All the children have said that they did not return home because of the blue fur lady. Now many children pretend to be the blue fur lady. It is very funny to see the little children playing this game. But the situation is serious, because all the children who have disappeared have returned home with punctures on their necks. Perhaps a rat or a small dog made these punctures. Letter from Van Helsing to Mrs. Mina Harker 24th of September Dear Madam, Please forgive me for writing, but Lord Godalming, Lucy's Arthur, gave me permission to read all of Lucy's letters. I see that she and you were very good friends. May I come to Exeter to talk to you? I need your help to help other people. It is very important. Please do not tell your husband now. I do not want to upset him. Again, please forgive me. Van Helsing Mina Harker's Diary 25th of September Van Helsing has come and gone. What a strange meeting. Everything is like a dream. I gave him my diary so he could read about what happened to Lucy. He was very grateful. Then he asked me about Jonathan. I told him that he had had a brain fever, but that he was much better now. But then I had to ask him for help, since Jonathan seemed afraid. We had seen a strange man in London, who Jonathan said was Count Dracula. After this, I had decided that I had to read Jonathan's diary. What I am going to tell you, Dr. Van Helsing, is very, very strange, I said. Oh, my dear, he replied, if you only knew how strange this story is. I then gave him Jonathan's diary, too. He said he will read it immediately. Dr. Seward's Diary 26th of September I am working a lot, and I am trying to forget poor Lucy. But this story is not finished. Van Helsing came into my office with an article from the Westminster Gazette. What do you think about that? he asked. I read about the children being taken away by the bluffer lady and about the punctures on their necks. Well, Van Helsing said, they are like the punctures on poor Lucy's throat, I said. And what do you think about it? he asked. Well, I said, I think that whatever caused the punctures on Lucy's neck caused the punctures on the children's necks. That is true indirectly, but not directly, he replied. Professor, I don't understand, I said. He asked, Do you think that the holes in the children's throats were made by the same thing that made the holes in Lucy's throat? Yes, I believe so, I replied. Then you are wrong. It is much, much worse, he said. What are you talking about, Professor? I shouted. The holes in the children's necks were made by Lucy. At first I was very angry, and I said, Dr. Van Helsing, are you mad? He looked at me calmly and said, Tonight I can prove it to you. Do you have the courage to come with me to the graveyard? to check Lucy's tomb. At ten o'clock that evening, 
we went secretly to Lucy's tomb. It was empty. We waited and waited outside the tomb. Suddenly, we saw something white moving through the trees. The white thing then disappeared. Van Helsing found a small child. He brought it to me and said, Do you believe me now? No, I said aggressively, because I did not want to see the horrible truth. 27th of September Van Helsing and I returned to Lucy's tomb. He opened her coffin again, and Lucy was there. She was more beautiful than ever. Van Helsing showed me her pointed teeth, but I still couldn't believe him. He told me that Lucy was now undead, or Nosferatu, as they call the undead in Eastern Europe. She could not die because the vampire had bitten her. She needed our help to really die and be free. I asked him what we had to do to free Lucy. We will cut off her head and fill her mouth with garlic. Then we will drive a stake through her body. But, he continued, Arthur must do this terrible thing, or he will never believe it. He will think we killed her, or that Lucy was buried alive. 29th of September Arthur, Quincy and I went to see Van Helsing. Van Helsing explained to Arthur about the undead and what he must do to Lucy's body. At first, Arthur was very angry, but in the end he agreed to come with us to Lucy's tomb. We went to Lucy's tomb that night. Before opening the coffin, Van Helsing said, John, last night was Lucy's body in here? I said yes, and then he opened the coffin. It was empty. We went outside to wait. Dr. Van Helsing put pieces of sacred wafer around the entrance of the tomb. What are you doing? asked Quincy. I am closing the tomb so that the undead cannot enter, he answered. We went behind some trees and waited. After some time, we saw a woman arrive. We could not see her face, but she was holding a child. She came closer, and in the moonlight, we could see her face clearly. It was Lucy. But her sweetness had gone. Now she was hard, cruel, and voluptuous. Her lips were red with blood, and there was blood on her chin and her white clothes. When she saw us, she moved back and made a sound like an angry cat. In that moment, my love for Lucy became hate. She threw the child on the ground and began to move towards Arthur. Come to me, Arthur, she said. Leave these others and come to me. My arms are hungry for you. Come and we can rest together. Come, my husband, come. There was something diabolically sweet about her voice. Arthur started walking towards her and she went quickly towards him. But Van Helsing jumped between them and held a gold crucifix at her. She became furious, and Van Helsing continued to hold up the crucifix. Then he said to Arthur, My friend, can I do what I told you? Arthur covered his face with his hands and said, Yes, do what you must do. Then Van Helsing put the crucifix away and took the sacred wafer away from the entrance of the tomb. We all watched in horror as the woman went through a thin crack into the tomb. The next night, we all went back to the tomb. Van Helsing opened the coffin again, and there was the beautiful body of Lucy.
Is this really Lucy's body, or some demon in her shape? Arthur asked. It is her body, and yet it is not her body, explained Van Helsing. Arthur, you must set her free. Arthur agreed to do it, and Van Helsing gave him a stake and a hammer. Put the stake over her heart, said Van Helsing, and hit it with this hammer. I will say a prayer for the dead. When you have finished, Lucy can finally have true peace. Arthur put the point of the stake over the heart, and Quincy, Van Helsing, and I began to read the prayer. Then Arthur hit the stake as hard as he could. The thing in the coffin moved about and screamed horribly. <coughs> its pointed teeth came together on the lips until blood came out. But Arthur did not stop. He hit the stake again and again, and finally the body stopped moving. That horrible creature was not there anymore. The real Lucy was there. Part 6. Racing Against the Sun Mina Harker's Diary The 5th of October, 5 p.m. The men have discovered the ship that is taking the Count back to Transylvania. It was not difficult to find because there was only one ship that was going towards the Black Sea. It is called the Tsarina Catherine. The box containing the Count is being taken to the port of Varna on the Black Sea. Dr. Seward's Diary 28th of October We left Charing Cross on the morning of the 12th and got to Paris the same night. Then we took the Orient Express east. We travelled night and day and arrived here in Varna on the 15th. On the 25th of October, we received news that the Tsarina Catherine was going through the Dardanelles. Finally, today we received a telegram saying the Tsarina Catherine had entered the port of Galatz, which is further north on the Black Sea. The Count has tricked us. Mina Harker's Diary The 30th of October when we arrived here in Galatz, we went directly to the port to see the captain of the Tsarina Catherine. He told us that the Tsarina Catherine had been surrounded by fog for most of its voyage and that it had travelled incredibly fast. In addition, mysteriously, it had arrived at Galatz instead of Varna. We then discovered that the box of earth containing the Count himself had been taken off the boat and given to a man called Skinsky. Skinsky, who was later found killed, then gave the box to some Slovaks. When I am hypnotised, I can hear the sound of flowing water and oars. Therefore, we know that the Count is being transported on a river. The river that flows closest to his castle is the Sereth. We must try to catch him on the river. It will be easiest to destroy him there because vampires cannot cross running water on their own. We have decided to follow the Count separately. I will go with Professor Van Helsing by train to the town of Veresti. At Veresti we will hire a carriage and go to the Count's castle. Arthur and Jonathan will go in a steam launch up the Sereth River and try to catch up with the Count's boat. Quincy and John will follow them on horses on the banks of the river. All of us have guns and knives because we know that there will be a fight. The Slovaks will try to stop us. 2nd of November, night. We have been travelling all day. The country is getting wilder. 
and we are getting closer to the Carpathians. Dr. Van Helsing says that we will reach the Borgo Pass by morning. We are going to the place where my dear Jonathan suffered so much. Abraham Van Helsing's Diary 5th of November, morning. I must write down everything accurately. We travelled all day yesterday. At around sunset I saw the Count's castle, as Jonathan had described it in his diary. I was both happy and afraid, because I knew that the end was near. We stopped the carriage, and I prepared a fire and something to eat. I gave some to Mina, but she did not eat. I was afraid that she was changing, so I drew a circle with the sacred wafer around where she was sitting. While I was doing this, Mina did not move or say a word, but she became whiter and whiter. When I stepped into the circle, Mina held on to me, and I could feel that she was shaking. Then I stepped out of the circle and went near the fire. Why don't you come over here next to the fire? I asked her. She stood up and tried to leave the circle, but she stopped. Why don't you step out of the circle? I asked. I cannot, she said. It was snowing and very cold. I began to be afraid, but I could feel that I was safe inside the circle. I began to see strange shapes forming in the whirling snow. I thought I saw those strange women that had tried to kiss Jonathan. I was afraid for Mina because those weird figures were getting closer. But she was calm and smiled. When I tried to leave the circle to add more wood to the fire, she said, No, no, do not leave the circle. You are safe here. But what about you? I said. She laughed a strange laugh and said in a soft voice, No one is safer than me. I wondered what she meant. But then I saw her red scar in the light of the fire, and I understood. She was safe because she was almost a vampire herself. Then the three women actually appeared. They came closer and closer to a circle. Come, sister. Come to us. Come. Come. They said to her. I looked at her and saw that there was terror in her eyes. Thank God she was not like them yet. And so we waited all night long with those horrible women around us. And then, at dawn, they disappeared. 5th of November, afternoon. I left Mina sleeping in the circle, and I went to the Count's castle. I knew from Jonathan's diary where the chapel was. I had to find at least three graves. I looked and looked, and I finally found one of them. It was the tomb of one of the women I had seen last night. She was so full of life and voluptuous beauty. I'm sure that in the past, when a man came to kill a woman vampire... He would look at her beauty, her voluptuous lips, and then he would lose courage. He would wait and wait, and then sunset arrived and the beautiful eyes of the women opened, and the voluptuous mouth would open for a kiss, and man is weak. And then there would be one more vampire in the terrible army of the undead. It was terrible to think that I had to drive a stake through her heart and cut off her head. I looked at her, and something stopped me. I could not move. Then I heard Mina calling me. Professor! Professor! And I woke up from my trance. I went to look for the other two graves. I found another grave, but this time I did not look at her. Then I found a high tomb... In this tomb was the most beautiful of the three. She was so exquisitely voluptuous that I could feel the instinct of man in me. 
but I was strong. I had now found all three of their tombs, but there was still one more, and it was bigger than all the others. On it, there was only one word. Dracula. This was the undead home of the King Vampire. I placed some of the sacred wafer in the tomb, so that he could never return. Then I began my bloody work with the three women. If I hadn't remembered the look of peace on Lucy's face, I could not have done that horrible thing. They screamed horribly when I drove the stake through their hearts. <coughs> and blood came out of their mouths. Now, those poor souls can have rest. I left the castle and returned to Mina in the circle. Come, she said. Come away from this terrible place. Let us go to meet my husband, who is, I know, coming towards us. And so now we are going towards the east to meet our friends. And him, whom Mina says that she knows is coming to meet us. Mina Harker's Diary The 6th of November It was late in the afternoon when the professor and I started to walk towards the east. It was very cold and snowing. In the distance, we could hear the wolves howling. After we had walked for about a mile, the professor found a natural shelter in some boulders on the top of a hill. Then he went out with his binoculars and stood on top of the rock. He started looking. Suddenly, he called out. Look! Look, Mina! Look! I climbed up on top of the rock with him. He gave me the binoculars and pointed. The snow was falling and the wind was blowing. Finally, I saw a wagon, and on the wagon was a great square box. My heart jumped because I knew the end was coming. It was late afternoon and sunset was near, when that thing would be free. A moment later, I saw that the professor had jumped down from the rock and was drawing a circle around it with the sacred wafer. After another moment or so, we could see again, and Van Helsing shouted, Look! Look! Two men on horses are following the wagon! They are getting closer to it! I could see that those two men were John and Quincy, and then I saw two more men racing towards the wagon. One of them was Jonathan, and the other was Arthur. We waited for the wagon to arrive. Every moment seemed like an eternity, because we knew that the sun would go down in a few minutes. The wagon was getting closer and closer. Suddenly we heard two men shout, Halt! Halt! One of the men was my Jonathan, the other was Quincy. Even though the men escorting the wagon could not understand the word, they understood the tone of their voice and stopped their horses. At that moment, Arthur and Jonathan raced up on one side of the wagon and John and Quincy raced up on the other side. The leader of the men gave an order to move. The men on the wagon whipped the horses, but John, Arthur, Quincy and Jonathan raised their Winchester rifles. Then Dr. Van Helsing and I appeared from behind the rocks. The men protecting the wagon saw that they were surrounded, so they stopped their horses again. The leader gave another command, and his men pulled out knives and pistols. They were ready for our attack. Jonathan and Quincy jumped down from their horses and ran to the wagon. They pushed the men away from the wagon, and in an instant, Jonathan jumped onto it and with incredible strength raised the box and threw it on the ground. Both Quincy and Jonathan jumped down again and raced to the box. I saw that Quincy was holding his side and that blood was coming out, but he did not stop. He continued helping Jonathan pull the lid off the box. Now the sun was almost down on the mountain tops. When they had pulled the lid off the box, I could see the Count lying upon the earth. 
He was terribly pale, and his eyes blazed with that horrible anger that I knew very well. As I looked at him, the Count saw the setting sun, and his look of anger became a look of triumph. But at that moment, I saw the flash of Jonathan's great knife. I screamed as I saw it cut through the Count's throat, and in the same moment, Quincy's knife went into his heart. It was like a miracle. The Count's body turned into dust and disappeared. I will be glad for the rest of my life, because in that moment, just before he became dust, I saw a look of peace on the Count's face. The men rode away quickly. Quincy had fallen to the ground and was holding his hand against his side, and the blood was flowing out. I jumped down from the rock and ran to him. The circle no longer stopped me. He was very weak, but he held my hand. Then he must have seen the sadness in my face, because he smiled at me and said, I am very happy that I could help you. Suddenly he shouted, Oh, God! and sat up and pointed at me. Look! Look! It was worth this to die. Look! Look! The sun was now directly on top of the mountain, and its light fell on my face. Together, all the men fell on their knees and said, Amen. When they looked at me, then the dying man said, Now, thank God that all has not been in vain. The red scar has disappeared. And then, with a smile and in silence, he died, a gallant gentleman. Note. Seven years ago, we all suffered greatly. But we think that the happiness we have now is worth it. Mina and I have named our little boy Quincy. This past summer, we made a journey to Transylvania. It was almost impossible to believe that what we saw had really existed. Every evidence of those horrors has disappeared. When we returned, we took out all the papers concerning Count Dracula. We saw that there were hardly any official documents among them. Most of the papers were our own personal diaries. Nobody would accept our personal writings as proof of such an incredible story. Van Helsing, who was then holding our little boy, said this. We do not need proof. We do not need anyone to believe us. This boy will some day know what a brave and gallant woman his mother is. Now he knows her sweetness and her love. When he is older, he will understand how some men loved her so much that they risked their own lives for her. Jonathan Harker <laughs>